Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Abbott's Address. Uh, today is Monday, August 3rd, 2020. So recently, uh, a new revelation to many came out uh, about Lama Surya Das. And um, of course, he's a, a well-known and influential figure in the Tibetan Dzogchen tradition. And um, he's been an influence in our Sangha to some degree. Uh, he wrote a book or two that we've used here and there. Uh, and yet, um, sadly, accusations and probably accurate ones about his uh, abuses have been coming to light of recent days. And, um, you know, this follows upon a string of other revelations of like kind that have been happening for quite some while, honestly. Um, decades, at least one, maybe two, I don't know. It just seems to me that most of my adult life uh not not i guess well adult de defined as over 40. <laughs> most of my adult zen life has been kind of washed with you know these uh zen teachers and buddhist teachers and what all you know uh, coming you know getting um outed for really really inappropriate behavior you know and now when i was young like uh, er, when I was 18, like this, and encountered the Dharma, this was kind of unknown. This was before the internet, so that wasn't a thing. And, you know, the Zen master was much more of a reified creature uh, back then, to its detriment. And um, so when I started training, I mean, the, the image of the Zen master, the Roshi, is this perfected human uh, that expressed the Buddha Dharma at all turns, fit right into my young mind uh, just fine. And, and fortunately, I never encountered anything that would count as abuse or anything like this. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, as I aged and as time went on and the baby boom generation became older, then different revelations came out and many of them very unpleasant. And I remember the anger I felt at the initial, uh, I think the first the first one that made any difference in my world was Gempo Roshi. And uh, he, he mattered to me because he was in the lineage of my first teacher, my first two teachers, my Zumi Roshi successors. And I liked him. I was fond of some of his stuff. I thought he had some mojo going. And to uh, hear of his sexual escapades with students was deeply disturbing to me. And... Um, so that was my first blush with encountering this uh, stuff, and that was quite a while ago. And unfortunately, as time rolls on, more and more teachers, not just of Zen, obviously, but in Tibetan and other lineages, um, you know, have stuff like this go on, Tri Ratna, on and on. So the question that I'd like to talk about today is what does that have to do with the Dharma? Okay, because... For some people, that can cause uh, kind of like a, a doubt in whether or not the, the Buddha Dharma itself is worthy or worthwhile or something like that. Um, and I get that. I mean, I get where that could be a place you could go. Um, but here's, here's the thing that for me uh, is a big turner on this, okay? The Buddha taught that whatever... I say, whatever you hear out of me in a Dharma talk or what have you, you must sift it through your own experience, okay? You have to sift the Dharma through your own experience and verify within yourself that the Dharma is so, okay? And that's the teaching. And that's very much in the heart of Zen practice, but it's, it's in all Buddhist traditions because the founder emphasized it relentlessly, really. So now if you've actually taken the teacher's advice, our founding teacher, Buddha, and take his word and actually take the guidance that you receive from the teacher and really reflect and put, your, put it through its paces, in your actual life and in your actual practice, then you discover for yourself something which is utterly reliable and not dependent on whoever the messenger was that pointed things out to you, okay? So it would be like um, 
let's say a young aspiring scientist has no idea of gravity. They don't know what that is yet. So they're in a science class and then a, a professor of science points out gravity and the proofs for it and ways to verify that it's a real thing. And student A just believes the professor and moves on. And student B says, well, let me let me see here. And so student student A never does the internal work to actually go through the proofs themselves to prove gravity or whatever. But student B actually does. They go through the reasoning, the rationale, the experiments, the whole thing, and they come to the conclusion, yep, gravity is a thing. And I feel it in my body right now. And then let's say after these students graduate from science school or something, that professor ends up having cancer and dying of cancer, a horrible cancer. Well, it, it's obvious that the poor professor's cancerous fate has nothing to do with the teaching of gravity, right? I mean, neither of those two people would have a problem with that. They see them as unconnected. But let's say that the teacher the science teacher um, came out with a theory themselves that they were vehemently in favor of. And then uh, it got proved wrong. Let's say, let's say that happened. Well, maybe the first student would think that all the theories that that professor had ever talked about are wrong and discount the whole thing. Maybe not, but maybe. It's kind of a far stretched analogy, but we'll go with it. But the second student wouldn't. The second student would say, well, that theory that he talked about was wrong, but gravity is, yeah, that still checks out. How does he know that? Because he did the work himself. Now let's get a little closer to the point. Let's say that that science professor ended up having their career just capsize and go down in flames because they were actually sleeping with students. See, this happens in academic settings too, okay? This isn't just a Dharma thing or a religious thing. This happens all over the place, unfortunately, okay? So let's say that this professor ends up being fired, they lose their professorate, uh, they, they're disgraced because uh, Title IX shows that they've been coercing students and having affairs or whatever. Okay, so that's awful. I'm not saying that that's fine. It's, clearly it's not fine. But let's go back to the theory of the, the, tr the scientific truth of gravity. Okay, if the first student who never did the work themselves to actually verify gravity's reality is so shaken by the moral failure of the, of the science teacher, they could end up discounting gravity in all of science. Yeah, I knew a scientist once that science is bullshit. That guy was sleeping with his students. Well, the second guy, the second person uh, who studied, say so she studies all the science and proves gravity. She's not gonna be happy with the fact that this guy's sleeping with students, but it's not gonna impact her understanding of gravity. Now this fails as an analogy because no one particularly holds a scientist to some particular moral standing, although we do hold professors to a higher moral standing. We should. Teachers should be held very intensely accountable for this stuff because, and I'll speak as a professor for a moment, professors too hold that archetypal role with the minds of young students, and it's absolutely unacceptable for them to wield it to their own gain in some Ill, ill-conceived way. It's not acceptable. Um, but let's flip back to our religious setting even more, okay? And even more in a Dharma setting because a, a, a Zen master or a Buddhist teacher, a Lama, a Sifu, a Guru, whatever, these are supposedly individuals who are embodying the Dharma and the Dharma is all about the alleviation of suffering. So this is particularly uncool. This is way, way uncool. It's like really bad, right? But even, even with that, Let's just be very clear. Any Buddha that you meet in human form is a human Buddha, okay? And human Buddhas still are human. And this is uh, maybe an insight for some, you know? A human Buddha is not some perfected being that can just drip purity at all times or something. I mean, they, you know, quite capable of mistake and quite capable of um, misjudging things. Okay, that's just the case, see? But two things about this. One, even if moral failings occur on the part of the teacher, and it's regrettable, and there needs to be consequences, and so on, 
Still, if the student of the Dharma took the, the Dharmic teachings that they received and verified them in their own experience and they were correct, okay, then um, those teachings are utterly reliable, even if the teacher or the messenger of the moment failed in some aspect of their life that directly conf can conflicts with the Dharma even. Still, still, those teachings are reliable because you, and you know this because you verified it in your own experience. If you just relied on the charisma of the teacher and you believed what they said and you felt good about yourself because you were believing what they were saying and you're deferring everything to them because they're hip and they're cool and you want to be liked by them and they pat you on the head and you feel okay, well, now your world's going to fall apart. And it should, because that world isn't worth holding on to, honest to God. No real teacher would function like that or allow it to happen around them. So that's the first point. Okay, if you verify, if the teachings that they gave are actual Buddha Dharma, and you verified that in your own experience, you can rely on that. And they can be, as human beings, they can mess things up. Now, one of the things that's occurred over time, okay, and this is this is new. This is a newer, well, new in terms of decades, okay. When I was uh, entering training in the in the 80s, there wasn't a really big emphasis on any kind of an ethics council or any kind of um, moral and ethical accountability or anything like that. I mean, that's just no one was talking about that stuff. No one was thinking about that stuff. We were all just mystified by the fact that this person was a Zen master. And that was it. that was it. And frankly, a lot of those Zen masters, they kind of went off on their own mountain and set themselves up in isolation. And they didn't have connection with a lot of other folks. And they were just kind of isolated with their students. Well, one of the things that we know now is that that's that's not really very healthy. In fact, that's not healthy. In fact, it's pathological. You, you don't want to do that. OK, this is not cool. And I'm happy to say that to today, I mean, it's completely understood. I mean, any any teacher, any lineage holder in my generation um, that I know of really values being connected with other lineage holding folks and exchanging and uh, being human together and talking things through. And actually, that alleviates a lot of stress. I can't imagine what it would be like to try and do this gig that I have as Abbott like alone. I mean, the abbot is always alone in a certain way, but without peers and without connection, connection and people I can talk to. I mean, for God's sake, it'd be like it'd drive you right into crazyhood. I'll tell you. <laughs> I think so. I mean, uh, so there's been a real sh change here from Lama Suryadasa's generation to mine. I mean, it doesn't hold all the time. I mean, the Sakyong Mipam did crazy stuff when he's younger than me. So it's it, it, it can happen anywhere, but the trend. I would say, is like this. And the other trend is that not only do lineage holding teachers, you know, reach out and stuff, but everybody gets the fact that there needs to be serious accountability within the Sangha for everybody's protection and safety, all right? Not just the student, also for the teacher, see? Uh, and this is commonplace now. There's nobody questioning that or, or saying that that's a bad idea. I mean, uh, you know, that come on. You know, so like in our own community, we have the EAR Council, the Ethics and Reconciliation Council, and it's populated by folks who understand ethics from a professional point of view as clinical psychologists and social workers and therapists and counselors and so on. Okay, so these are folks who are able to and empowered to stand aside from any other consideration and simply investigate ethical dilemma if they occur and as they occur. And it can happen in any direction, by the way. It can happen teacher to student, yes, but also student to teacher. That can happen too. And also student to student. That can happen too. And, and anywhere you've got authority and levels of empowerment, there's always gradations of evaluative authority and all this stuff. It's, it's like that, okay? So it's a messy part of growing up. We've got to realize, you know, hey, everybody, including the abbot, including all the way down to the newest person walking in, there are expectations for everybody in the Sangha. Nobody has the right to be here just because they think they do. They don't. You violate things, you go off the deep end, you can be asked to leave. That, that happens, okay? And that includes everybody, all the way from the abbot, all the way to the newest person walking in. 
see. And then today, I, I, I would say, uh, and I hope I'm right on this, that th this is commonly known. I don't personally know any other lineage holder in the Dharma that wouldn't readily agree and enthusiastically so with all of that in all the lineages, including Tibetan, you know, and Zen, and Theravadan traditions, uh, you know, all of them. And because everybody's been burned, okay, there's no lineage that escaped human frailty. It just hasn't happened. And part of it is when the Dharma came to the West for the first blush, you know, first 50 years or whatever, there's a lot of perfume and sandalwood and robes and wow, you know, and it kind of clouded things. And, you know, that's, you know, I love perfume and sandalwood and robes and incense, but okay, where we can see through that shit now to like, hey, don't be an asshole, huh? <laughs> and you can be, and it's not acceptable, see. Um, so this leads to uh, a realization that things can't decay forever, okay? Nothing decays forever. Yeah. Big tree, there it is, big tree. And then it comes to the conclusion of its life cycle or it gets infected by termites or what have you, and the big tree falls over and thus begins the process of decay, decline, it starts. Now, it can seem like it takes a long time, but whether it seems quick or fast to you is kind of irrelevant. The fact is, decay starts, and the process begins, and what was big and strong and obvious falls and starts to decline and degrade. But it doesn't just degrade forever, and then that's all terrible, and that's the end of everything. Not hardly. What ends up happening is decay has its peak, has its end. There comes a time where the decay process starts to shift into being nutritive, okay? So like little mushrooms start to come out of the carcass of the old tree, you know, little mushrooms start to come out, right? And then as the decay process continues, other shoots start to grow from the decay. And eventually, 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 that big old tree thing is completely, uh, it is decayed to such a degree that now there's nourishment for the new, the next growth that occurs, you see. And this is unstoppable. This, does, this doesn't depend on people being nice or agreeing. This is just nature's law. This is the order of the universe kind of stuff, okay? Stars are there and then they have their lifespan and then they go boom, and then they fling their guts to the entire cosmos and the thing starts over. It's just, it's, this is not up to opinion right so decay inevitably leads to growth this is what i'm saying and in regards to this whole business about zen teachers in our little century last you know last half of the 20th century first half of the 21st century um there's some uh decay going on that actually needs to happen this idea that teachers are immutable efficacious at all turns, can never do wrong, uh, and have rights to just do whatever they want all the time. It's just bullshit. And that, that idea needs to fall, and the next thing is, in fact, sprouting and growing. And I, in my opinion, you know, what we're seeing with Lama Surya Das, and I hope not, but probably others that get revealed over time, is just, you know, more evidence of this log having been felled. And from it, though, comes things like the younger generations of practitioners saying no more, not acceptable, and newer sanghas having ethics uh, policies that have teeth in them, absolutely. Uh, and as far as it goes, every uh, peer organization that I'm a part of and spiritual community for Buddhist teachers, all of them, we all have ethics requirements, AZTA, uh, American Zen Teacher Association, which I'm very fond of, and the uh, Generation X Buddhist Teachers Mahasangha, which I'm fond of, and a few other uh, kind of loose and informal teacher networks that I'm a part of. All of us. Everybody's on the same page here. And you're not going to hear about them because they're not making news like Lama Das is today or last week or whatever. But believe me, the larger health of the Mahasangha is strong. And these logs have fallen and the nutrients are being taken in, and um, actually all the songers are now stronger for it. Not excusing what they did, 
uh, not making light of it, not saying it doesn't matter. It matters. Suffering happened. That's not acceptable. Uh, and yet, take heart, okay? Decay has its end. Growth comes.